If you have your Bibles, please turn to John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. Hear now God's holy word. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. And this is God's word. Amen. Please be seated. Well, before I begin, and I'm thankful to Larry Sachs who uh, allowed me to speak to the tragedy that struck a PCA church uh, last week. Uh, I'm sure everyone here has heard Um, of Covenant Church and their school Um, and uh, very eerily similar to our last 40 years of a PCA church and and school and um, the death of the shooter but then also the six victims. Uh, It was a a difficult week for many of you who have connections to Nashville and and to Covenant and um, Let's continue to pray for them, their senior pastor who lost his own daughter uh, in the tragedy there, uh, the head of school, uh, and again, like I said, uh, with four other victims. uh, We need to pray for those who remained and and their families and for that whole uh, church and school community. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, gracious Heavenly Father, we ask Oh, for your mercy. You are present help in our time of need. You hear the cries of pain and sorrow of many in the Nashville community, but especially uh, our fellow PCA Church Covenant Presbyterian and their school. And we ask that, Lord, you would meet them, oh God, in their great time of need. And Father, uh, You call us to rejoice with those who rejoice, to mourn with those who mourn. Oh, we mourn this morning uh, as we enter into Holy Week to remember that as we mourn that there is hope at the end, hope that will be fulfilled because your son will come again and renew all things and to make all things new and put an end to violence and sin and strife and tragedy will there be no more tears no more pain no more shame and so father we stand with covenant presbyterian church and their school now as we humbly try to pray and intercede for them discerning what we can do to come alongside in the more practical ways but for now lord help us to um, really keep them in our hearts and our minds as we uh, pray without ceasing uh, for their um, restoration for their healing and for the gospel to be proclaimed in, even in the midst uh, of such a horrible incident. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our church. We thank you for hearing all the saints across the world and in our country and in Nashville as we are seeking for your mercy. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, over a decade ago, right after my pastoral internship there in Center City, Philadelphia, I took a pastoral position at a local church in North Philly, and we weren't a huge congregation, but our congregation had so many children, uh, most of them under the age of six. And although that was a chaotic season for the church and families, it was just a joyful part of doing ministry. Uh, But one of the most adorable things I got to see was when it came to Palm Sunday, the start of Holy Week, just like we're celebrating here today. All the children's ministry kids would run out with these palm branches after the service. It wasn't kind of part of the service, but it was what they were doing in children's ministry. And they came out running 
uh, with these palm branches. Sorry, Jeff, I, I think I might be getting double uh, audio from the pulpit mic or uh, my eyeglass mic. But they, they would come out uh, with these palm branches out of the church, and, and they would run around showing these palm branches uh, to their moms and to their dads and to everybody else, and it was uh, so adorable. And I'm assuming that's happened today, where they're showing their moms and, and, and dads what they were doing. Now, most of them probably didn't have any major idea what its symbolism and significance was at all, but it was so precious nonetheless. But why did our church then have palm branches? What was its significance? Why did we have children today come in with the same things and shouting out Hosanna? Well, it goes back to this account in John chapter 12. It's actually an account that all four of the Gospels narrate, but for today we'll, we'll discuss Apostle John's narration of what happened, especially since we're in the Gospel of John in our current series. But before we get there, let's get the context for what is happening. Here at the beginning of what we historically call Holy Week or Passion Week, the week leading up to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In chapter 11, you don't have to turn there, but Lazarus, a close friend of Jesus, he dies but is raised up again by Jesus. And so the Pharisees plot to kill Jesus because of this. They didn't care about the miracle actually happening, but they wanted to kill Jesus because they realized their way of living, these religious leaders, their power, their influence, is surely going to be overrun and replaced by Jesus himself. But Jesus, he's not alarmed at this, at opposition or threats to his life. He was already predicting to his inner disciple crowd that his death would come, but he realizes now the hour is at hand. And right before our passage in verse 12 in chapter 12, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He stops by Bethany to be with Lazarus and his family. Some remember the poignant moment with Mary and her expression of love by using all the perfume on Jesus' feet. And so we See then in verse 9 through 11, Jesus enter into Jerusalem and allow me to read this portion. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Look, if you have your Bibles open, look at verse 11. That's a, a wonderful bookend to all the way to the end of today's passage in verse 19. Many were starting to follow and believe in Jesus. So therefore, the chief priests, the Pharisees, they're not happy. We've seen this paranoia before, even in the beginning chapters of John in the last several months here. But now Jesus' popularity is at all-time high. He actually raised someone from the dead. The chief priests who you would naturally expect to be all for the promised Messiah come. They want to put an end to Jesus and the proof of this miracle, even Lazarus, to death. And then we're here at the start of today's passage, verse 12. The next day the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Now this is the, the week, the beginning week of the Passover feast of Passover, the coming Friday. But the Passover feast is just starting, and so it's drawing hundreds of thousands of people from a very, very large region to come to Jerusalem to celebrate this feast. It was a huge part of Jewish tradition. And for the Jewish people, this was commemorating what? God's saving work of rescuing them from slavery in Egypt. Some of you guys might be pretty newish to church and, and you heard of Passover, but what is it actually about? If you go all the way back to Exodus in the Old Testament, where God through Moses, you know, proclaims the 10 plagues over Egypt so that they would, Pharaoh would let God's people go. The final and 10th plague was God will kill all the firstborns in the land. The Israelites were instructed to protect themselves, to place the blood of a lamb over the doorpost, and no harm would come to them. God would essentially, and here's where we get the word, pass them over and spare them if they had this blood over the doorpost, and the blood, of course, prefiguring the shed blood of the true lamb, Jesus. 
That Jesus' shed blood is, would finally avert the wrath of God that we too deserve. This is, of course, grace that we're seeing in Exodus all the way through the scriptures to Jesus. And so from that generation onward, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions, would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, the holy city, to make sacrifices to God in remembrance of the liberation during the annual Passover festival. It was a big deal. And by the way, this is why Good Friday and Easter Sunday are on different days every year because of the Hebraic calendar and Passover event. Sometimes it's March, sometimes it's in April. So people were already making their journey towards Jerusalem, but when they heard about this Jesus and his miracles, boom, word started to spread, crowds got excited. Finally, the Messiah they had been waiting for is here. Now, you have to get this. You have to get this. As, I, as I've stated here many times before, Jewish people in this day, and even I would say Jesus' own disciples, oh, they wanted a politically strong, a powerful type of Messiah, someone who would liberate their people from oppression and their enemies, namely the Roman Empire. Oh, God, you did this in Exodus, and you liberated us from the hands of Pharaoh. Now do this again through the Messiah from the hands of the Roman Empire. Remember, even Peter the apostle, he didn't want Jesus to die. He wanted to set up a kingdom with Jesus here. But still, word spread oh, that this Messiah is coming. Look at your Bibles, verse 13. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. Now we can get to the explanation of the symbolism of the palm branches. Palm branches equaled, it was, a, it was a natural symbol of Israel. In the ancient Near East kind of context, thousands of years ago, palm branches represented victory and peace. This was meant as something celebratory. So in other gospel passages, they would lay down their cloaks when, when Jesus was riding on a donkey in and other people laid down these palm branches. Hosanna or Hoshiana in Hebrew literally meant, save us, we beg. Well, we read earlier in the service a prophetic word from Psalm 118, verse 25. It says in English, save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. That phrase, save us, we pray, is Hoshiana, where we get Hosanna. And people got excited because the long-awaited Davidic king, who David writes this in Psalm 118, this was referencing or prefiguring in Psalm 118, finally here in front of us. But again, probably not in the way we as Christians understand Jesus to be the Davidic king, a spiritual king. No, they wanted again the powerful king to overthrow all their chains from their oppressors, including the Roman Empire. This is the Messiah we have been waiting for. And so many of the multitudes are crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna. But just days later, many of them, if not the majority of them, will switch their speech to cry out, crucify. Crucified. I'm not saying all of them did, but many of them were just caught up in the fanfare and the excitement. Hosanna, Hosanna, and then five or six days later, or whatever it is, crucify, crucify. But for those with the correct view of Jesus and those who are just in the height of the Christ surrounding Jesus, what they are shouting is actually true. This is the long-awaited Lord and Messiah. Hosanna, Hosanna is appropriate language to be used on behalf of Jesus. I like what a reformer, a great reformer in the 1500s, John Calvin from Geneva, Switzerland, noted about this, that the Spirit of God can put the right words in our mouths when he so desires, even when we don't fully understand what we're saying. And so we see in verse 14 through 15, and Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Jesus was not just a sentimental favorite, someone who was simply raised well and seemed to be a good candidate to become king. Rather, Jesus was from the very beginning truly God and, how, uh, and now incarnate truly man, fulfilling all that was prophesied from the scriptures of who would be the Messiah. And so where do we again see this part of the fulfillment of prophecy? Well, we spoke some of this earlier in the service, Zechariah, Zechariah 9, 9 through 10. O the coming king of Zion, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, 
humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the later in verse 10, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. You see, Jesus has come to Jerusalem to inaugurate his coming reign and rule, but through his impending death. That is so countercultural. It's so different from what the world would naturally expect. Again, John Calvin, the reformer, said, when he describes Christ as riding on a donkey, the meaning is that the kingdom will have nothing in common with the pomp, splendor, wealth, and power of the world. But think about it this way. If you were Jesus' PR representative, you were a new hire, and you're like, I can't mess this up. i got to really impress Jesus. And you were in charge of the grand entrance into Jerusalem to receive all praise and hype from hundreds of thousands of people, even if riding on a donkey in the ancient Near East context meant something of weight and prestige, you maybe would have been tempted to say, let's go a little bit above a donkey. Let's bring a hundred military horses and dress Jesus up And that will be a wonderful entrance. But a donkey? Well, yes. To fulfill scripture. And that Christ has come in peace, not war. To again, as Calvin said, that the kingdom will have nothing in common with the pomp, splendor, wealth, and power of the world. But John Calvin goes on to note that Jesus is willingly, uh, Jesus willingly and with all humility approaches Jerusalem not to start his grand campaign for world dominance, but rather that he has come to die. He says he openly declares that he commences his reign by advancing to death. Again, that's so opposite to our logic, to our thinking, to our cultural norm. After I finished probably 95% of the sermon this past week, I was driving, visiting my mother in Virginia, and I do this often where uh, I'll stay overnight in the middle halfway point in Cleveland because it is a great excuse to go to their museums. I, I am, I, I'm a big fan of museums. Don't judge me. That's just what I do. And I love the Cleveland Art Museum. It's free and it's, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. But I knew, because I'm a crazy person, I knew a long time ago that Cleveland was going to have a special exhibit during the spring and summer months about the Tudors. Some of you guys know the Tudors, English royalty, it's my cup of tea, no pun intended. But one part of the exhibit highlighted a painting called The Field of the Cloth of Gold. And I thought, that is a great title, cool story. But anyways, The the Field of the Cloth of Gold. And the painting portrayed a a competitive show of treasure and wealth between 20-something-year-old King Henry VIII and the 20-something-year-old king of France, young pups just trying to show off their majesty. So did they hire uh, Robin and his PR firm of 10 people? No, they hired 6,000 workers to host this, not a day or two, but 18 days of overindulgence of prestige, wealth, and power with a show of rare art and riches, luxurious food, and and intense tournaments. Even King, Ar- uh, uh, King Arthur, King Henry VIII, dressed up as Hercules. He, he, was, he was cosplaying, basically, saying, look how majestic I am. He came in dressed up like Hercules. Each nation representing, presumably crying out for their own king. Look at our king. Look at his magnificence. Look at his wealth and power. And I immediately, just standing in front of this exhibit, just started to think of my sermon, of this text. Oh, what a contrast with our Savior, the true King. Oh, how humble is he, yet also ruler over all. But I mean, really, think about it. Jesus entering Jerusalem. Who starts their reign by advancing to death? Who does that? No, we are used to people beginning their reign by conquering over a people group, over some political and military power. But Jesus starts his reign by dying and thereby conquering sin, death, and Satan, all vindicated and validated by the actual resurrection of himself, of Jesus, after his death and burial by the power of the Spirit. 
But in the midst of all the fanfare and excitement, people were looking at Jesus as someone who had, to, had come to conquer the world and that those who follow him would benefit from the spoils of war. Oh, but they still could not understand. Jesus was not setting up shop to build a geopolitical war machine, but he came to die to then reign over the whole universe in the spiritual, sitting at the authoritative right hand of the Father. And yes, when Jesus someday returns, and he will, every knee shall indeed bow before the return of the king. But his disciples could not see this at that moment. The crowds were most definitely could not either. Look at verse 16. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. I like to imagine the disciples looking at each other after they have the aha moment of Jesus' resurrection and ascension, almost like a, a jovial pulling someone close by the collar with all glee and excitement and joy. I can't believe we didn't see all of this in the first place. How We were so blind. And then the other just said, okay, can you let me go? I get it, I get it. We're, we're happy, we're joyful. But oh, and believe me, the aha moment was not just about the two scriptural references that we just talked about, Zechariah 9 and Psalm 118. But after his death, resurrection, ascension, everything started to connect. All the dots, all the prophecies, every last detail was part of God's plan and how the scriptures had to be fulfilled in one person, in the Christ, as the true Messiah and Redeemer. The resurrection is what allowed the disciples to understand. Nothing would make sense unless Jesus was resurrected, or as the Apostle Paul says, if he wasn't raised, we should be pitied more than anyone else in the world, and we would be left in our own sins. But the resurrection is what enables us to see the beauty behind Palm Sunday. It's why we should be so excited to return next Sunday, to celebrate that to connect the dots of Palm Sunday to Good Friday to then the Resurrection Sunday. The kingship, the praise, the humility is finally all understandable because of Christ's finished work on the cross and the supernatural raising of our Lord from grave, from the grave by the power of the Spirit on the third day. This is the essential basics of the gospel. Hoshiana indeed. Victory and peace indeed. And so now to our final stretch of the passage. Look at verse 17 through 19, the crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. You see, the Pharisees are so displeased. If you're new to all of this, friends, the Pharisees were a section of the Jewish religious order and leaders that were very proud of their law following. It's what they thought was going to get them into heaven. So much so, they demanded everyone not only to follow God's law, but their own made-up human laws drawn up over hundreds of years and collected. A very straightforward way to seek to control people with their man-centered rituals and laws. And so if Jesus is coming preaching his gospel and grace, free grace, that nobody can be saved unless through faith in him and his finished work. These Pharisees and other religious leaders are not happy. This is wrecking their game of influence, turning everything upside down. So they're paranoid. They not only seek to kill Jesus, but Lazarus, who was raised from the dead. The crowds are at a frenzy. The game might be over for the Pharisees. And they have this pitiful lament in verse 19, pondering how they could ever compete with what Jesus is so powerfully doing. They said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Of course, they exaggerate and say the whole world is going after Jesus, but they realize the end might be near for their religious stifling control. And I think, friends, actually, that's really relevant for us as we segue into our application, moving from Jerusalem now to Chicagoland, to Elgin. Are we uber joyful? that Christ did not come to set up a geopolitical powerhouse. Ask that of yourself. Or would we rather prefer he did that right now in a topsy-turvy world? 
Are we super encouraged and gospel motivated because Christ came to establish a spiritual kingdom and a spiritual reign and rule over his people? Or do we inwardly clamor for more power and prestige to be exhibited here on earth in regards to Christianity? Are we spirit-filled and so glad that Jesus came humbly on a donkey, inaugurating his reign by coming to die? Or would we rather him actually not die and just militarily destroy all that stood in the way? Which, which crowd would you be a part of 2,000 years ago? Simple questions, but I think uncomfortable questions when we get to some of the roots of our hearts. Friends, these palm branches are not just for children. And I'm so glad that children are the ones that carry the branches because we are called to have a childlike faith. It is a great representation of what Scripture pictures for us. But they're symbolic reminders for all of us. And we are so blessed and glad that when our hearts are redeemed and born again, we can actually cry out, Hushiana, save us, we pray, and actually mean that in the spiritual sense, in the gospel sense, in the saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone sense. And so church and, and, and visitors and friends streaming or here in person, what are you crying out, Hosanna, for? What are you crying out, Hosanna, for? So you can finally get your dream life? Hosanna, Hosanna. So you can finally get out of some stress or circumstance so that you can have ease and comfort again. Hosanna, Hosanna. Not that we want to suffer, but we, we have such an anti-gospel sentiment when we want all the glory for ourselves and our lives and never expect any hardship or suffering in this sin-torn, fallen world. So friends, why would you wave your palm branch before the Lord? And if one by one you came up to this pulpit mic and we were brutally honest, and I'm including myself here, Perhaps there would be a whole lot of fill-in-the-blank answers that are antithetical to what the scriptures are pointing us to. Why? Because we're sinful. And yes, although if you are saved, you are liberated from the dominion of sin, yet we still wage war with the indwelling presence of sin. So why would you wave your palm branches before the Lord? A wonderful question to ask yourself this week. And may it be only for this reason that he is the only one who is to be praised as the true king, as the true king that can come and save, that as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's why we say Hosanna. And so to rejoice, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And then back to 2 Corinthians 5, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Friends, we wave our branches in our hearts to give Christ his due praise of the victory and peace won through his perfect righteous life, his atoning, propitiating death, and his vindicating resurrection that we can finally take the message of hope and truth and plead for those all around us, oh, be reconciled to God. Why? Because the king has come. Praise be to the king. Hosanna. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we ask, O oh Father, that the Son, King Jesus, would reign over us. That he would reign over our minds. That he would reign over our hearts. Over our sicknesses. Over our struggles. Over our pain over our joys, over our whole lives. And as the word says, and that is why we do not have to fear. Help us to remember to fear not, O Heavenly Father, because Jesus is reigning so that you may be glorified most richly, O merciful, gracious Heavenly Father. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.